Gil Garcetti, you are someone to whom retirement is a dirty word. <laughs> now, you've gone from working in the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office for 32 years to being elected to the Office of District Attorney for Los Angeles County, which you held for eight years and at that time handled many of our highest profile cases like O.J. Simpson, Rodney King, Michael Jackson. Now you've, you're an artist with gallery exhibitions and books published on your photography. Also, a television consultant for a new series. Now, how does a successful politician change careers and become an artist? Maybe I was always an artist. I certainly always carried a camera in my pocket, even when I was district attorney. I always had a small point-and-shoot camera in my pocket, and I'd take it out at various times. I usually wouldn't bring it to my eye. I would just keep it at waist level and take two or three uh, photographs in that fashion. I viewed myself then as an urban photographer. It was a passion, it was a love that I always had. I displayed my photographs in my various offices, and I always had requests, I want you to do a show. In fact, I had an offer from a couple galleries to do shows, and I said, not as long as I'm connected with the district attorney's office. That's a full-time commitment. So how did it happen? I think all of us have a little bit of artists, maybe a whole lot of artists in us, if we just uh, open our eyes and give ourselves that opportunity. How did you get interested in doing iron? Your f first book, is it? Yes, Your my first, first book. book. On iron workers and the actual understructure of an incredible building. There were two things I wanted to be in my life once I became aware of what a college was, things. One was a composer conductor. That was the first thing I wanted to be. Quickly realized I didn't have the talent to be a composer conductor. The second thing I wanted to be was an architect. I've quickly learned too that not only didn't I have the talent, uh, but those guys, and primarily men uh, who became architects, were working so hard <laughs> in college. I said, well, maybe past that. In this instance, you have to picture what happened here. June 2001. I'd been out of office for six months. My son had just been elected to the city council. I had decided I'm taking six months off to just do whatever I want. I'm leaving a meeting downtown and I'm literally between the Walt Disney Concert Hall and the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion Music Center. I look to my left and I see one iron worker who's crawling over a high arched beam on all fours. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. I have to photograph this. And so I started photographing, went to the dark room, liked what I saw. How do I get on? The Mortensen Company, the general contractor, you know, gave me one of these. <laughs> a little more significant than that, that's right, <laughs> than that. Well, I'm pretty focused now. And I remember, wait a minute, the iron workers, the iron workers are the ones I want to photograph. But I also want to photograph the beauty of what I saw to be the raw geomet geometric forms that the iron was creating. So I'll call the Iron Workers Union because they were politically supportive of me. So I called them. The man picked up the phone. His name is Jack, and said, "Hi, Gil. We'll send you a thousand bucks." Well, he thought I was running for office again. I said, "No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not running for office." And finally, we worked a deal where I would come and take photographs. When I started doing this, all of a sudden, I realized. My first two loves, composing, conducting, and architecture, were now right there in front of me, and I was doing it with the medium that I had some comfort level with, photography. And it was marvelous. And so I just started handing the guys the photographs. And it was their idea for the book, not mine. They kept asking me after a while, well, are you going to do a book, Gil? I said, no, I'm not doing a book. So you're going to do a book, Gil. No, I'm not doing a book. 
Finally, there was one man who said, you have to do a book. I said, why? I said, because when the building's all finished, Frank Geary's going to get, the architect, will get all the credit. And no one's going to remember us. That really hit home for me. My father had been a barber, my mother a meat packer. They never got public thanks for anything. So I said, if the photographs are good enough, we'll go forward. What I didn't want to happen, I was afraid that a publisher would say, sure, we'll publish it because of my notoriety. And then when it comes out, it would get panned by the critics. And I could handle the criticism, but I didn't want to embarrass the iron workers because all the proceeds from the book are going to the Iron Workers Scholarship Fund. And so we started looking around, and every publisher we went to wanted to do it. They convinced me that, yes, there's no question about the photographs. But then it was a Philharmonic who guided me. They said, stick with a publisher that specializes in art and architecture. And that's what happened. That's why I went to Balcony Press. They looked at it. And we decided, let's move on this. And we worked very quickly. Now, how were the images selected? Was there a curator as such? or? Did the publisher do that? Did you select your favorites? She asked me. <clears throat> we were going to publish about 100 books. I'm sorry, 100 photographs, not 100 books. I said, you go through them. And she guided me. said, you know, the book should be telling a story. Because I'd never done this before. And so I did. I went through it and I selected about 150, I think. I said, I can't go any further than this. I mean, now it's up to you. And she said, that's fine. That's what I expected you to do. She and her staff then started going through them and said, all right, this is our final cut. And I went through them. We had some disagreements and we both hurt each other and then we arrived at the, the decision which photographs were going to be included. Did you try and select at least one photograph of each of the workers? Oh, I couldn't do that. Yeah. It was impossible uh -huh. uh, to do that because overall, at one time, I think maybe they had about 149 uh, iron workers there, but there were periods of time when someone would be there for a month, two months, and then leave, and then come on. So there were probably several hundred iron workers overall who worked there. Got it. Um, going back you, earlier, you mentioned about the works and the, you know, the, the, yes, the workers were important, important but also the, the Geometry actual, of the iron. Yeah. yeah. Is, is it true that each one of those pieces of the underskeleton is different? There are no two the same? There are about 14,000 pieces of iron in that building, and not two are intentionally identical. What kind of a camera do you use? For the first book, I use a Nikon F100. For the second book, because I'll show you, I mean, this is the second book is completely different. Yeah, these are the ones. Yeah, these, God, they're so gorgeous. Yeah, these photographs were taken with a Hasselblad X Pan, a panorama camera, 35 millimeter. It's the Hasselblad X-Pan is a fabulous camera. This, and I don't mean to overstate this, Lynn. The first time I looked through the viewfinder of the Hasselblad X-Pan, I believe I became an artist. Because at that point I realized, look at this, look what I can do. And I saw things I hadn't seen before. And I had so much fun taking photographs. I mean. Like this. I mean, they just. So this was the the Hasselblad X Pan. The book is called Frozen Music. That's kind of a catchy title, right? <laughs> and how did this come about? Was this this was obviously not the iron workers' idea. This was this your idea? Did the publisher come and say, "Let's do another one"? It was another accident. Another. Yes, if, if it could be a message to, to young uh, photographers and others, I said, when you see an opportunity, don't pass it up, grab it. It was a year ago, January, uh, that Hasselblad, Hasselblad Cameras, contacted me 
and said, we really loved the photographs in your first book, but why didn't you use our camera? And I smiled and I said, I'm not going to walk the beams carrying a medium format camera. It's too dangerous. I said, oh, we have a 35 millimeter camera. It's a panorama camera. And they loaned me one. And I started taking photographs, just experimenting. Different films, I was having fun. I loved the photographs. In May, a friend of mine, David Hume Kennerly, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, called me, and he's always trying to help me. He said, I have someone over at my house. Bring one of your books and some of your photographs. And I said, okay, but I'm going to bring some new photographs. I want you to take a look at them. So I did, went over there, and they looked at my first book, and they were very nice and looked at the photographs. And then I said, all right, David, I want you to look at some of the new photographs. And I gave him some 16 by 20s of some of the images that were are in Frozen Music, and he went crazy. He said, these are spectacular, Gil. And I said, I, these are just marvelous. You've got to get a new book out by the opening of the Walt Disney Concert Hall. This was in May. The Walt Disney Concert Hall was opening October 23rd, same year. And I said, that's impossible. Can't do it. No, no, it can be done. Go to your publisher. If the publisher says no, come back to me. I'll find someone. I went to my publisher, showed her the photographs, and says, oh yeah, we'll do it. And my idea then was, all right, completely different book. There'll be no text. I want people to look at this book. Of course, I didn't have it. But it was some, a larger book, and I want people to feel that before they touch it, they have to put white gloves on. I want that kind of a feeling. A very high-quality, high-end you know, uh, book. Fine. The printer came up with the idea of doing two things, debossing each page so that it's hard perhaps for you to see it, but it's like when you receive an invitation and the paper in the center is pushed down, that's where the image will go inside that. And then another suggestion was put it, bind it so that it can be unscrewed and you can take the photographs out and the people can then frame them and because it's on a debossed paper it looks like it's already been matted. That's how it came about. And it's a limited edition book and we're going to sell out of this book. There's no question about it. How many did, you, did they print? 1,500. It's yeah. fabulous. Yeah, it's Just been... Fabulous, uh, yeah. Um, who was the printer? Was it local? Not all, obviously not offshore. It was no, it was done right here. So Pace fun. Navigator in, where are they? City of Industry. Huh. Do a great job. Well, it sure looks like yeah. it. Yeah, they huh. really do. Amazing. The first book was really a salute uh, to the iron workers. They like so many of our tradespeople, like all our tradespeople, do not get the same respect and recognition that many tradespeople in other countries get. So I felt that if I could do something for them, this would be great. And it's worked. You know, they have been getting recognition where the, I don't think they would have. The second book is really a group it's a portfolio of photographs, is really what it is, of the abstract art that's created by both Frank Gehry and the iron workers. And when you look at this, I hope that some of these photographs capture the spirit that this building seems to generate. I have, I'm an architectural maven of sorts, but I have never, ever seen a building that seems to lift the spirits of people. And it does. This building does it. And in this book, in my photographer's statement, I mentioned the fact that said, if you get that kind of a feeling from either seeing the photographs or going to the building outside or inside or both, don't just thank Frank Gehry. Thank the iron workers. Thank the other people who made this possible. Have you been to Bilbao? I have not, but we're going this spring. Uh -huh. So I was going to say, I would be curious to hear, you know, how you will compare them. Right. It would be interesting for me yeah, to do it. Yeah. 
And you also said earlier that the money from the book iron goes into a scholarship fund at the Iron Workers Union? Correct. That's wonderful. Well, the, the iron workers get paid decent money when they're working. And by decent, it's not really that decent when you consider you know, the risks that they're taking and the injuries they'll walk away with when they retire. But they're not always working. And to a person, they're very proud of what they do, really proud. But almost to a person, they will also say that, yes, I would like to see my daughter or son as an iron worker, but before they make that decision, I hope they at least have the opportunity to go to college. Your trip in Cuba, you, you expressed a, a real interest in, in dance, in the Cuban music and dance. Right. And is another book going to come out of this? I think so. <clears throat> That's what I'm working on right now is dance in Cuba. It's a, um, one of the things that attracts you immediately when you're in Cuba, for whatever reason you're there, is the music and the dance every place. And then if you go to the ballet or the folklorico ballet, you just see you know, how important this is uh, to the people of Cuba. Well, I'm trying to capture some of that. And hopefully it'll work out. I'm working on it right now. Oh, that's fabulous. Thanks. Because um, that is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gil, thank you very, You're very much welcome. for taking your valuable time and no talking problem. to us. It's Thanks been for the a joy. opportunity. Great. A joy. Super. Thanks. You're welcome.